Hello and welcome to Zagreb, Croatia. This is the best of the day from European Focus on MPN and MDS. My name is Sergej Verstovšek. I'm from MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, and I'm joined by my colleague and friend, Professor Dr. Alessandro Vanucci from Florence. Hello, Alessandro. Hi, Serge. Very pleased to be here in this wonderful city. Thank you. And we had a very lovely discussion over the last three days on the topics of MPN and MDS, the areas of the malignant hematology that is developing very rapidly, particularly MPN, where we are learning at a rapid pace about biology, and we are actually developing quite successful new therapies. In the biology session today, we had uh, interesting uh, observations on the utility of newly discovered mutations in MPN in particular, where we don't use them only for diagnostic purposes, which appears to be the main reason to test for, but also for prognostication, in particular in certain patient populations. And you laid some of these discoveries. Can you tell us briefly, where do you see the utility for testing with new mutations that we know now exist in MPN? Yeah, so Serge, as you were saying, you are perfectly right in telling that these, some of these mutations are needed for diagnosis, but they are also providing additional information in terms of prognosis. So the same three mutations that are defined as phenotypic driver mutations that we use for making diagnosis, since they are part and will be also integral part of the next WHO classification, and these are the JAK2 v 617 f mutation, the JAK2 exon 12, the MPN mutations, and the carreticular mutations. These are needed for diagnosis because they are measure diagnostic criteria, but we know now that they can also help to identify subpopulation of patients. This is particularly important in the case of primary myelar fibrosis because we know that the prognosis of KR mutated patients, especially of type 1, carreticular mutated patient is definitely better than that of patients who harbor the JAK2 or MPL mutation. But I think that the most important information is that there is a group of so-called triple negative mm -hmm. patients that are those with a dismal outcome in terms of survival. And in addition to these, we have other mutations that constitute the so-called high molecular risk group, and these are mutations in AZXL1 EZH2, IDH1 and 2, and SRSF2, and this point to a group of patients with primary myeloid fibrosis who, independent of the IPSS and the IPSS plus score, have reduced survival. So this information should be obtained in patients, especially in young patients with myeloid fibrosis, where we think about the opportunity of stem cell transplant, because they might help in making therapeutic decisions. This is very useful information because part of the presentation was on the discovery of prediction to a response to ruxolitinib, a JAK1, JAK2 inhibitor that is now in widespread use for a therapy of patients with intermediate and high-risk myelofibrosis. And it appears that the presence or absence of any of these mutations does not affect the utility of the drug in attaining the spleen control and the quality of life improvements, as well as there is no impact on these mutations on the chance of prolonged survival with ruxolitinib, which is quite interesting finding. So utility of this testing for mutational profile lies primarily in the bone marrow decision-making process. Now in a myelodysplastic syndrome, on the other hand, the complicated picture is becoming even more complicated. The number of uh, mutations of different kinds is continuously rising. And uh, while we have some uh, ways of a prediction or prognosis based on these mutations, it looks like that we are a little bit um, at odds of how to use them for uh, uh, therapy decision making. There is not much uh, uh, utility there, for, uh, there like uh, it has in acute myeloid leukemia, for example, with targeted agents. Correct. We probably, in some cases, we have even too, too many informations that we are not able to handle right now in terms of using them in the daily practice to, to make prognostication. Take, for example, the case of the P53 mutations that are one of the most common events that occurs in the transformation of these disorders to acute leukemia. 
where they are found at the time of transformation. So they, they are useful, of course, to understand the mechanism of transformation, but they are not useful to predict evolution to acute leukemia in the single patient because they do not anticipate so much the transformation of the disease. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Kralowitz gave an elegant uh, analysis of an extensive mutational profile of a number of patients that transform from myeloproliferative neoplasms to acute myeloid leukemia. His summary was that each individual patient had a different path forward through transformation. This is quite amazing and it's important for future planning what to do. Yeah. So to say in two words, each individual patient is an individual. That's right, that's right. But it, it's a real problem uh, for us to identify ways of tackling the transformation process and treat these patients because they don't do very well. On the other hand, there was also a good summary of a 5Q minus syndrome, not just the biology but also a therapy in the uh, MDS session. Looks like we finally have some understanding what actually is the problem and how lenalidomide actually works. Yeah, I think that this is really a nice model that has provided basic information that translated quite soon to the clinical practice in terms of also understanding how drugs may act. This is an example of haploinsufficiency and there are a number of uh, genes, coding genes, but also macroRNAs, and this is probably one of the best characterized instances where macroRNAs are involved in the pathogenesis of disorders that actually help to understand how the disease is uh, coming out and what are the possible mechanisms of activity, of specific activity of lenalidomide that, has, that seems to be the right drug for this, for this right uh, combination of mutational events. Quite unique, actually, but may be applicable to some other deletions of different chromosomes, like 20Q-, which is the hot topic at the moment to understand what it actually does. Now, moving on to myelofibrosis topic, in uh, the meeting, there was a lot of discussion about ruxolitinib use in patients with uh, myelofibrosis intermediate and high risk, and uh, how long does it last, and what combinations might be useful to boost the response, prevent a loss of response, or bring additional benefits. And we had the two talks on the investigational approaches as well as on commercially available medications that potentially can be combined. We had a number of those investigational agents that uh, make sense to combine. How is your, what's your assessment of, of these preliminary results that was uh, presented? Well, I think that these, uh, as you are saying, preliminary results so we cannot take any conclusion about these studies. What is emerging is the fact that for sure ruxolitinib is a drug that can be quite easily combined with other drugs in terms of safety and toxicity, but I think that there is also some important sig signal of activity, especially in the combination with the p kine inhibitors. There's also a translational background of these and the preliminary data from a phase two trial that is ongoing actually suggests that this combination may provide some additional benefit. Of course, as you mentioned, uh, one specific category of patient that is in need of additional uh, effective treatment is the one of patients who lose the response after some times of ruxolitinib treatment. And this combination seems to be active also in this group of patients. Some of the commercial available medications were mentioned as possible combination in a safe way, like you said, safety first, in combination with ruxolitinib. So for anemia, there was a suggestion perhaps to use danazol. There was also a study underway in combination with pomalidomide or erythropoietin or interferon. Also for patients with high percent of blast, addition of hypomethylation agents, why there's our dacogen, looks like a number of combinations that are very useful to c tackle specific problems in myeloid fibrosis are being developed either in investigational area or just in standard clinical practice. Now beyond the ruxolitinib, there are other JAK2 inhibitors. Momelotinib and pacritinib are in phase three studies. And we learned a little bit about uh, the results of pacritinib, a phase three study results were recently announced to some degree in patients uh, versus best available therapy with myelofibrosis in frontline setting. Can you tell us a little bit about what actually happened? Yeah, well, the results, the preliminary results of this phase three trial with pacritinib have been made public recently. 
And so the, uh, these results suggest that the primary endpoint of the study, that was the reduction of the spleen volume of at least 35% from baseline by MRI, was actually uh, reached by a significantly higher number of subjects as compared to those in the B80 uh, arm. And I think that the most important information from this trial is that the trial included also patients who are thrombocytopenic, that is a group of subjects that has not been considered in the COMFORT trial. And there seems to be clear safety, but also efficacy also in this group of patients. And another preliminary information that of course needs to be clearly analyzed is about the impact of treatment also on anemia, because there was a proportion around 20% of the patients who had improvement in anemia. Beyond the JAK2 inhibitors, there are other investigational agents, and several of them have been briefly reviewed. One that caught my eye, just to explain, in fact, the better way how the JAK2 inhibitors work, was a study on a JAK1 inhibitor. The JAK1 inhibitor in malofibrosis and preliminary results were presented at ASH, and in this meeting again, showed some modest reduction in the spleen, and quite good the result in the controlling the symptoms, which to me suggests that really one does need a combination of inhibition of both JAK1 and JAK2 in malofibrosis for uh, the results to be seen, like momelotinib or ruxolitinib. So while I was not uh, disappointed with the results of JAK1 inhibitor, it does control symptoms very well, not uh, that it does control the spleen very well, and it is was very safe, no malosuppression. I question whether there is a real role for JAK1 inhibitor in malofibrosis. Well, I don't know, but I totally agree that this trial provides very important information about the mechanism of action of these drugs and also about the pathogenetic mechanism of malofibrosis because it's clear that you need some kind of malosuppression uh, linked to the JAK2 inhibition activity to have the full spectrum of clinical efficacy of, the, of these drugs in the patients, reducing the spleen and improving the symptoms. And seems, it seems to be possible to dissect these two levels of activities by using a specific JAK1 and the JAK1 and JAK2 inhibitor. So it's difficult at this time to say what might be the, uh, the, t the right target of patients for just a JAK1 inhibitor in malofibrosis. Now, beyond the JAK2 inhibitors, there are some other targets, and two hot drugs that are currently being investigated in early phase studies are PRM151 and uh, Imetelstat. The PRM151 is the uh, pentraxin 2, which is differentiating factor for monocytes to fibrocytes. The fibrocytes are uh, hematological derived cells from monocytes that might have a role in the bone marrow fibrosis in myelofibrosis as a disease. And uh, preliminary results uh, show that in uh, 25 patients that were treated with uh, PRM151, which is injectable weekly or monthly, those patients, 11 of them, had improvement in the bone marrow fibrosis over time, and in some patients actually led to improvement in platelets in particular, and few others improvement in the red blood cell count without overt toxicity. So it's a very intriguing kind of proof of concept study in a small number of patients that perhaps additional different biological targets may have a role in the whole concept of a myelofibrosis on its own. It's not just about the intracellular signaling, but fibrosis might be a target. The other one was imetalstat, which is telomerase inhibitor, a very interesting concept of preventing the renewal of the DNA loss that happens with the proliferation, where the early results showed that uh, among 33 patients treated, the early first 33 patients, there were four CRs and three PRs, which is quite amazing. We don't hear often that any medications can produce a complete response. What, what's your take on these particular uh, medications and results? I agree with you that this is an exciting idea because it's totally different mechanism. So there's uh, some background also in terms of what we know about the abnormalities of telomerase in cells of not only of cancers but specifically of MPNs. And I have to say that there's a so huge interest in these drugs, not only by us as clinicians but also by patients. And so we, we are really looking forward to the new phase two trial that has to be activated, should be activated shortly. 
in patients who are resistant or have lost the response to ruxolitinib as second line treatment. Mm -hmm. So we, we look forward to, to this trial with much interest. The new approach in therapy is also to move from advanced myeloma fibrosis patients to earlier phase and to PV, where the goal would be perhaps to prevent things from developing or in PV to treat the patients that don't do well with the standard practice. And you in particular have been involved in a nice discussion about the role of ruxolitinib in early stage myelofibrosis, where patients do not have yet any problems, but to prevent problems from developing, which does not appear to be easy task. Yes, but I think that this could be really one of the first cases where in this field, in these disorders, we use stratification about uh, using prognostic variables. So it's clearly difficult to, to show that a drug can prolong survival in patients where their expected survival is in terms of more than five, six, eight years. But we know that by using some molecular variables, we can substratify patients even in the lowest risk categories according to the clinical scores, and these patients show prognostical negative mutations. So this could be this this problem could be approached by making careful stratification of the patients and using some kind of different measures for the outcome, such as for example progression free survival, event free survival. So I think that this must be explored in clinical trials, but it's really an interesting idea that if you can prevent the progression of myelofibrosis with the drug, then you can really impact on the natural course of the disease in this low-risk group of patients. So we, for now, have a ruxolitinib and JAK inhibitors as a tool to combat already present symptomatic splenomegaly or general constitutional symptoms, and the field is moving toward early intervention to prevent things from developing. Now, in polycythemia vera, which is much more benign condition, of course, there are patients that do not do well, and we were able over the last five years to identify those based on a response or no response to hydroxyurea as this common first-line therapy. It seems that the patients that do not do well on hydroxyurea have a higher tendency to transform to acute myeloid leukemia or myelofibrosis as well as have a low, shorter survival. And uh, recently, about three months ago, there was an approval of ruxolitinib in patients with uh, polycythemia vera intolerant or resistant to hydroxyurea. The discussion now is how many patients actually are like that and what is the real utility of a JAK inhibitor in polycythemia vera? I think we had a really lovely discussion because that's a new territory, first ever drug approved for PV. Well, uh, more or less 15% of the patients with polycythemia vera develop some kind of resistance or intolerance to hydroxyurea. And this was really an unmet clinical need for these patients. So that's clear indication to the use of ruxolitinib in this niche of patients. But you very nicely discussed about, uh, ab about the possibility, the, pot the potential to enlarge the target population for this kind of drugs because you correctly pointed out that symptoms are not included among the variables that make a patient resistance or refractory to uh, hydroxyurea. And some patients actually suffer from the disease, not only for the difficulties to control hematocrit or for the larger spleen, but also for the symptoms, constitutional symptoms and other symptoms that are associated with the disease. And these might be actually a new target population for the drug. Of course, we need clinical trials in this, but I think that you were right in uh, raising the point that, of course, now the drug can be used in, in hydroxyurea refractory resistant patients, but we might start to think about other uh, implications for patients with PV. It's not the end of the story. And likely the other group of patients where you are leading efforts in clinical research is the patients with this plant vein thrombosis where present with normal counts and have a splenomegaly or enlarged liver and uh, have not been a focus of any research so far. This group of patients by definition would require therapy yet they have a normal blood cell count and it's not good. They have a clot, they have enlarged organs, the studies are being done under your guidance with the JAK inhibitors in this group of patients as well. And then another group of patients in PV is so-called masked PV, 
which appears to be leading to uh, modifications in the diagnostic criteria for PV, along the way with introduction of the genetic information in that concept. You have presented some summaries and plans for modifications of diagnostic process here. Yeah, of, of course, all these changes are clearly the reflection of what we have learned in terms of diagnosis by using molecular markers. So I think that most of us was surprised to, to find some uh, healthy subjects with slightly increased hematocrit who were jack 2 v 6 and 7 f positive or had the exon 12 mutations. And so these patients now can be considered to have what is early or must polycythemia vera, we, ha we, we can discuss about the terminology, of course. And the diagnosis is clearly supported by the abnormalities in the bone marrow biopsies. So the population of patients with the MPN is clearly increasing because we are able to identify earlier phases of the diseases. And with any other uh, major meeting, the last topic uh, is the transplant. That always comes as the only curative potential either for MPN, advanced uh, myelofibrosis, or myelodysplastic syndrome, and we also had a summary on chronic myelomonocytic leukemia. In MDS part, the use of cytoreductive therapy before the transplant has been suggested and argued very well that perhaps hypometal hypometallation agents are the way to go in majority of the patients because of safety and potential benefit, avoiding the toxicity related to the induction chemotherapy. In myelofibrosis field, there was a lovely discussion about using JAK inhibitors for a short period of time before the transplant because it seems that preliminary results show some benefit in that regard. Yeah, this is uh, the consequence of a lot of discussion in recent years about the need to perform splenectomy before a stem cell transplant because we know that huge spleens delay the engraftment of the cells and maybe also associated with other types of complications such as thrombosis and so on. So the, there are trials ongoing and the preliminary results are quite interesting that suggest that a short term of ruxolitinib before uh, transplant may be useful because it reduces the spleen but at the same time also improves the general conditions of the patients. And the better fitting patient to the transplant is a premise for having better results and reduced toxicity. So it looks like uh, the field is moving in many different directions and we are covering many different subtypes of patients right now, which is very good because the standard practice has been established now, both in MDS and MPN. And Need, and it needs to uh, evolve in these specific directions. So I would like to thank you very much for a lovely discussion and thank you all for joining us here at the European Focus on MPN and MDS in Zagreb, Croatia. Have a nice day. Thank you.